Pumpkin spice. Feelings? Thoughts? Texture-wise, it's real gritty in my hands. Well, yeah, it's a seasoning. It only comes around in the fall, so that makes sense. It has no pumpkin flavor to it. It's mainly just like clove. Yeah, where's the pumpkin? Yeah, there's no pumpkin in pumpkin spice flavored things. It's got some nutmeg. Because it's originally mm-hmm. made for like pumpkin pie, right? Yeah, it's cinnamon, clove, and nutmeg. But there's zero pumpkin to it. No one thinks of pumpkin pie when they get pumpkin spice because they think latte or exactly. coffee. Exactly. And little known fact, when you actually make pumpkin pie, you're not actually using pumpkin. You're using a different squash because pumpkin makes terrible pumpkin pie. But then what's in the canned pumpkin I don't know what's it's what not yams, is it, it is off the top of my head. What's yams? It, that's sweet yams potatoes. Is sweet potato. Yams is sweet potatoes? Yeah. Sweet potato. Why don't they call them sweet potatoes? Well, then? because they put them through a process where they get a sugary glaze so they make them sweeter sweet potatoes. So a yams doesn't grow in the ground? No. Yes and no. No. Oh, gosh, but there, what? Are, but there are specific kinds of like actual there yams, are yams that grow that are purple yams. Yams true, are things. True. So why, how can a ground yams also be a sweet potato canned yam? I don't have any idea. You're saying a pumpkin pie isn't pumpkins and a yams isn't yams. Yes. Marcus. I have no idea what y'all are talking about. Hey everybody, I'm Dane Holland. I'm Austin Shazam Pfeiffer. I'm Marcus. I am Electric Man! And I'm Austin Tiny Zen. And we are Nerded Through the Grapevine, the podcast where four best friends gather weekly to talk about our favorite parts of past, present, and future nerd culture. And I want to start off by saying, I don't give a shit about Star Wars. Well. Now what could that mean? Are you just trying to get somebody angry? I'm trying to get you riled up. Oh, well, well I mean, we all know that that's a lie. Because, exactly. It is a lie. But to an extent, it's not a lie. And to where it is a lie is that I adore Star Wars and the universe that it is and everything in the movies and on screen cannot get enough. Just put it directly into my veins. But when it comes to things outside of the television involving Star Wars, I don't give a shit. And it's weird because... There, there are Star Wars video games where I get to be the Jedi. Like I get, that's me. I'm the one with the lightsaber cutting them down and and doing my thing. That's incredible. I don't care. Like I, I get them. I play them for a little bit and then I stop. Like you would think, since I love Star Wars as much as I do, throwing me into that world and giving me control over something would be exactly like right up my alley. But it's not. I just fade off. I and I don't get that. I, I don't know. I just I wanted to hear from you guys if you've got different IPs that cross different types of of media that all of a sudden you lose interest in it because we know a lot. I mean that's how they make money as they go off into these other types of media where you've got the comic books becoming you know on screen or in games and all kinds of stuff like that, especially with things like Star Wars and. There are trading card games and board games and comics and everything and novels. Like I've tried to read some of the Star Wars books and I just I lose interest so quickly. And is it because it's not that good of a story? Probably in some cases Probably. it is. Yeah. Like I think without seeing it, without seeing the visuals, it's maybe not that good like of a sci-fi yeah, I mean, plus some of that could be just the author, because several different authors write Star Wars stuff. Oh yeah, lots of them. Because you've, I mean, you've been going through the Bane trilogy. Tiny, have you read the Bane trilogy? Uh, I've seen a little a here little and bit. there, but yeah. not actually. I did sat the first book, and then I kind of DNF'd the second. Right, but the second one's cool so far. It's just getting back into it. Plus, I've just been a lot busier. Right. So, but um, you've enjoyed it. I enjoyed the first one yeah. fairly well. Yeah, and I, I tried some of the uh, the. The High Republic, which is the newer, the newest storyline of Star Wars uh, that's come out since the Skywalker saga. And I started it and I was like, I was interested, you know, like kind of what was going on and stuff. But then I just got to a point where it was about four or five days after I had read it, uh, read, you know, a few chapters in it. And I just like didn't go back to it because I was like, I don't care. I just didn't care. I've had a 
Fallen Order, Jedi Fallen Order, the video game for a long time. If it uh, squadrons, I think well, that was just squadron? a poopy game. I think yeah, was it a poopy squadron. game? It's already down to like twenty bucks, bro. Is it really? Yeah, well, dang. I, I saw I, it yesterday. I Fallen That's Order why. wasn't that great either. I mean, that was just my opinion. Yeah, yeah. I can see why it would be cool, mm-hmm. but uh, it just didn't do it for me. I feel like the only Star Wars game that I actually enjoyed and felt like was successful was Knights of the Old Republic. Mm-hmm. Other than that, they're just kind of garbage. Like the old Battlefield Two, Battlefront Two, was really good. Well, though, I right? never played that one in all fairness, but all the other ones that I've tried, just terrible. Mm-hmm. I enjoyed Super Star Wars: Return of the Jedi on Super Nintendo. <laughs> So there's a Star Wars when you like. So you guys can suck my toe because you have to play your newfangled 3D games. I'm playing it on the Super Nintendo emulator. And like even moving away from Star Wars like into something like Lord of the Rings to where <laughs> I I like Lord of the Rings. I do. I like it. I like fantasy. But I'm not like, I still haven't watched the best movie of all the movies. I've watched them and it's like, I'll get to it. Like, But I'm not... I'm not craving it. Yeah. But then like next year with Magic the Gathering, a card game I love to play, they're going to have Lord of the Rings be part of a set of that. And I'm excited for that. Like that's getting me more excited in Lord of the Rings than Lord of the Rings itself because it's already a part of something that I enjoy. And I I want that to be something for you to where I'm like, man, this will be a perfect chance, Marcus, for you to get into Magic because you already love Lord of the Rings. But is that going to be something like me with these all these other Star Wars outlets to where I just don't care because it's Probably. not yeah because it's not <laughs> given to me it. in the original form yeah if they make a Magic the Gathering movie which I'm sure they will at some point they were working on a show I think and I, I haven't heard it. anything about it in a while so first of all there's just some stinkers you know like some entries in the franchise whether it be mm-hmm. whether it be comic books or video games I mean some of them are just crap I mean it's like I wanted to play this game because I hoped it would make me feel like the movie or whatever, or maybe right. it's just by itself a good game. Mm-hmm. Like for me, Shadow of Mordor were both just pretty good games. The second one, not as much, but it had some cool additions. But it's just, uh, you know, it breaks all the lore, and so then it just at some point begins to not feel like your story. Mm-hmm. But it's still a good game on its on its own, and it kept my attention Yeah, despite all that. You mentioned Dragon Ball Z? I did. That's mine. My IP that does not translate to anything else besides just watching it. Really? Yes, because Dragon Ball Z, of course, has a card game. It's got mm-hmm. video games. It's got, you know, I've, I've read the manga on it, but the manga and the anime actually differ. So it's kind of like following different stories. Mm-hmm. But in Japan, they've got different Dragon Ball games that come out with more weekly release kind of stuff, which it's not every week, uh, but I think it's called Dragon Ball Heroes. And what that is is it takes characters from these different alternate universes to where, like, say, Super Saiyan 4 can actually exist. Mm -hmm. Because it's just, yes, it really does exist in Dragon Ball lore, but it's from a different universe. So that's the kind of stuff they do in Dragon Ball Heroes. And I, I can't get into all the stuff because Mm -hmm. the thing that heroes does is it's a card based game and they try to get you hooked mostly successfully by the animations that they bring out for it so they'll make these animations for it that are actually you know dragon ball z dragon ball super actually done for the show kind of style of anime Mm -hmm. uh same people and everything that voice them same people and everything that make them uh, but it's just not something that I follow. Yeah, Tiny, do you have any IPs that Dungeons and Dragons? Okay, like it. I love playing the game in and of itself, right? But when it gets mucked about in other things, I, I don't like it. Because, mm-hmm. for instance, Stranger Things, people are like, "Oh, you'll love Stranger Things if you love Dungeons and Dragons." No, I don't like that show. I hate mm-hmm. it. I didn't like when they mixed Dungeons and Dragons, Dungeons and Dragons with magic. Love magic, mm-hmm. love D and D. Terrible set. Had some cool cards, but the mechanics lumped into it just did not translate well. Mm-hmm. Why am I adding dice rolls to my card? I mean, come on, that don't make mm-hmm. sense. So when you mix it, that and uh, yeah, just not. Is that like not. with the with the Dungeons and Dragons movie coming out? What like maybe next year, maybe or something like well, that? How do you feel about that? Th- that's a little different. It's taking. The game and almost okay. So there, there's novels based on different campaigns people have played. Mm-hmm. So to make it into a movie, I'm cool with that. You know, 
it's it's still taking it as a basis and using it as inspiration. That's fine. But when you use it as, I don't really know how I'm very poorly describing it. I'm cool with the movie. Yeah. That that's, that's the best I answer gotcha. I can yeah. give you. Yeah, no. And it, it is a weird thing. Sometimes it's hard to describe because I think, and I've been thinking about it as to why it is that I just cannot get into like these IPs that I love so much outside of the, this one type of media with it. And I think it's because I want to be disconnected from it in a way. Like with Star Wars, I want to watch Star Wars happen in front of me. Like I don't think I want to be in it. I think me being in it and me making decisions and doing things like that, I think it takes away from the story that I'm watching happen in front of me. And I think that may be part of it. Yeah, well, I mean, think about I mean, if you're watching Star Wars, I mean, it's such a visual phenomenon anyway. I mean, right. that's one of the big reasons why it was so popular. Is because of its cutting edge visuals and things like that. Mm-hmm. Super fast paced action, you know, it's just snappy. Yeah, it, I mean, it's automatically just more fun to to watch it than it is to read about it. Mm-hmm. Plus the the cheesiness involved with it too, like all that. Like I feel like that part, that charm is taken away in the other forms uh, of of Star Wars for me because you don't you don't get the campiness in the card games or mm-hmm. the the video games try to sprinkle it in but it's not really it doesn't feel organic. Well, that's what I love about those a lot of the audiobooks on Audible of Star Wars is that they add in sound effects and music. Mm-hmm. To me, that makes it much more digestible in book form. It does. Yeah. Just the sound of I mean when somebody draws their lightsaber, I want to hear it. I mean, yeah. of course I can, you know, play it in my head, right. but it's just not the same. It's not yeah. the same. It takes yeah. a lot more work. Right. Vroom. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, vroom, exactly. Dang, that's a deep cut. Uh, something that is coming out very soon, I think maybe next year, it, it is called Lorcana. I think that's how you pronounce it. And it's Disney's, Disney is trying to get into the trading card game like Magic the Gathering and Pokemon. And it's called Lorcana. <laughs> and they, like this happens all the time. It is really, really hard for a trading card game to become popular and stay popular. They die out so fast. And it's because like these systems are so complicated because players will play the game to break the system. That is what most players are doing when they're trying to to make a deck for any of these deck building games is how can I break this game in order to beat my opponent? And the people making the game have to consider that. Like whenever people are going to play this game, that's everyone that makes it needs to be able to play it with that mindset and it's why a lot of games end up failing because the systems end up so broken and in so many pieces and they can't bring it back together that it's just done for like no one everyone moves on from it and magic the gathering has such a history and pokemon have such a history for forever and they've got such a huge fan base and they've been the ones to survive and disney's trying to get in on it and they've done it in the past and failed but this seems more almost like a direct rip from magic because they see what works and they're going to try it with this, which I think in a way it's a good way of getting a younger crowd into a game similar to magic because magic is like a lot of the artwork and a lot of the story is not kid friendly. And Disney's had a little bit of training with this. I think though, because we own quite a few Disney trading card style games ourselves already within, you know, owning villainous you know, yeah, that one's a board game. Yeah. yeah, but if they can take the, I mean, all you're doing if you're having a trading card game is just essentially laying it out. Like, say you play Yu Gi Oh, or you're playing Magic, mm-hmm. you know, where you have to lay it out in front of you like that anyway. I mean, they've already done that in yeah. one form. I mean, they even had, you know, the Marvel, uh, what is it, Smash, Smash Up? Up? Yeah, yeah, they had that. Um, the Marvel Villainous to go along with Disney Villainous yeah. showing. Vill- Villainous is good. Like, it's a fun game. It is actually very fun to play. And I mean, it's cool to play as the villain, and the only way you can win the game is by accomplishing your, you know, main objective. Like, you're going to take over the world this way, or you're going to, you know, kill the puppies this way. Cruella de Vil, sorry. Kill the... I mean, she was making fur coats for the puppies. You know she had to kill them first. If, if <laughs> anyone tries to harm my puppy or anyone else's puppy... <laughs> I'm going to hurt you bad. <laughs> well, that was Corella Deville in the uh, 101 Dalmatians. That also goes for kitties, even though kitties hate everyone. <laughs> and you just mentioned the like Marvel villainous. Like, so Disney owns Marvel, Disney owns Star Wars, and Disney owns you know the regular Disney titles and things like that. So 
IP wise for this game, they don't have to go through a bunch of red tape to get these characters into this card game. Like it can, it can be a Star Wars set because a lot of people that play Magic are like, you know, the I think it's a Beyond Universe Beyond Universes Beyond or something is I think in Magic is what they call it whenever they get other IP stuff involved, and like with uh, Dungeons and Dragons, but that doesn't really count because Wizards of the Coast owns it too. But people have been like, well, why why hasn't Magic been able to go you know get a Star Wars like little small set or something like that? Well, I think Disney's probably been planning this for a while. And now they can do it themselves. Like they can put their Star Wars characters in this Magic the Gathering like card game. And that's going to bring a whole different crowd in. The crowd not like myself to where if Star Wars is involved, they want to be a part of it. To where me and like, well, I mean, that's cool. And I hope someone enjoys it. But I don't think it's going to be for me. But it does seem like a game that, let's say, someone that wouldn't normally be interested in a card game like Magic well, now, okay, well, what if Magic were Disney characters? Like, think about it that way. Maybe they want to interact with that more. And I, mean, I don't know. I think it's a good way to get into it. They took a gamble on it whenever they made Kingdom Hearts by crossing over the Square, yes. e- the Square Enix platforming with mm-hmm. Disney characters to go along with it with their own original storyline and game uh, you know, mechanics and everything yep. else, too. So, And uh, by God, they did it. Uh, so, if I mean, if they can make their own popular video game franchise that – literally just took something that was already happening and mm-hmm. then just put their own spin on it and then made it an entire successful, you know, stretch the entirety of the series. I mean, you had Kingdom Hearts, Kingdom Hearts 2, with a chain of memories, 365 two days. Uh, like, uh, gosh, there's so many other ones too. Kingdom Hearts 3 was another one, but you, you, they super video game selection for all of that mm-hmm. based off of just them taking that gamble, trying that out. And they've got enough money to get good development on stuff so it could oh, yeah. it could work out yeah well they could they could they could hire on people that have even worked for like making the game of magic in the past onto their team to be like okay where do people normally screw up and i think if the game the game itself character wise they that's already going to have a draw the fact that they're kind of marketing it as their competition to magic that's going to have its own draw it's going to come down i think to the mechanics of the game because it's actually a fun game to play and it's not going to be a broken mechanical mess to start off. And I think that is going to be their biggest issue because as far as keep on like for them to keep coming out with sets of different characters and different cards, that is just limitless of what they can pull from because they can have the same character in a different costume from a different, you know, movie or show or their own ideas completely for the game. Like they have they have they are not lacking in the character department. So I don't know. I, I think it will end up flopping just like most trading card games do. I think it's their attempt at jumping on the hype train of trading card collecting right now. And th- there's a lot of talk about it in the trading card game kind of world. Uh, but I think a lot of people do feel like it's going to go the way of most and, and eventually fall out. But we will see. Jumping off of your topic, the IP crossover thing, I... Mm-hmm. I've recently read a book called Ready Player One, Mm -hmm. and the book in and of itself was fantastic. Then I jumped over to the movie, and before I watched the movie, I thought, I I can already tell that it was going to be bad, because there are many, many crossovers within the book. Um, The book is set in the year 2045. It's a dystopian time, like there's they're in the middle of like not an economic collapse, but more like a stagnation. There's an energy tri- crisis going on, and these two gentlemen develop something called the Oasis. Think of kind of like a voluntary matrix thing. So you put a, hook on these goggles and these gloves, and some of them have haptic suits if they've got enough money, so they can actually feel what's happening in the Oasis. So it puts you in another world. Um, that world started off as a MMORPG that just springboarded into another world that you can take part in. There's other planets that they can go to, and they can pretty much be or do or have whatever they want. Um, they pull from Dungeons & Dragons. 
uh, Ghostbusters, Back to the Future, all the great things from the 80s and the 90s are contained within this world. And the book itself is fantastic. So knowing all the things that was included in the novelization going into the movie, I'm like, there's no way that they're going to have the licensure to bring all the things in. <laughs> right. And oh boy, did they. <laughs> there was, there was an immediate deviation at pretty much the word go. So ready. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's I mean, the word. Like the, the little <laughs> opening monologue was kind of word for word from the book. After that, it changed drastically. They changed names of characters. They changed actions of characters. I can understand changing the contents to suit what they could get licenses for. I was okay with that. I was anticipating that. If you've read the book, do not watch the movie. That's your opinion on, I think, about <laughs> everything. Well, no, I can I can <laughs> deal with some things, you know, because I realize that they have to change some things in order to make a movie work. Mm-hmm. But the book's and always better. We all know that. That's, it is. That's just the but way this it was, is. This was a whole other level of garbage. It was definitely hot, stinking fecal garbage. So how did they? How did they uh, get around the licensing stuff? They pulled in a few things, but then they just changed a bunch. Um, in the book, the main character. Okay, there, there's an Easter egg hidden inside the oasis by one of the creators who passes away in the beginning. And if you find the Easter egg, you get his shares in the company, you get all of his money, all of his property, and you get his, basically his user license because he's he's a super user because guess what? He created this thing. And the, he left a clue in this video will, essentially. And it took him about six years to find the first key because there's three keys and three gates and everything has a puzzle and it's all steeped in eighties and nineties lore movies, songs, uh, D and D's in there, you know, so they have to go through all these things and figure it out. And then when you get to the movie, the first thing for the key was a race. And I'm like, what is this? It like, it, it like I said, it's nothing like it. I'm and get, then I'm getting some Westworld vibes. Yeah, it kind of it's kind of Westworldy, um, but more like futuristic looking. Yeah, like yeah, because it's in a digital space as opposed to a physical one. Yeah, so right. there there's some of that suspension of disbelief with some of the actions that they're able to take. You know, being able to defy gravity and there's everybody has a stat block and they have classes and so you get that hint of MMO in there. Um, there's magic, there's sci-fi, you know, it's a blending of all these different genres kind of rolled into one. But really it's just like chubby kids sitting in their room like, I mean, it could be. (laughs) Well, it could be, except (laughs) pretty much everyone in this world is hooked into this. So you are, your mom is, your grandma is, everybody's in here, but you know, obviously... it's their own persona. It's all sor- It's all sources of entertainment in one thing. Exactly. <coughs> and you can travel into and out of different things. So, like, if you want to watch a movie, you can actually essentially be on the set and watching it happen around you. It's a very cool idea and a very cool premise. So I can finally have Mace Windu fight Lord Zed. Finally. Yes. For those of you who have not read the book... Watch the movie. It's very entertaining. <laughs> yeah, I mean... It is pretty entertaining. I, you I, had did, no- I did say watching it, like, the visuals are great. If you haven't read the book, you'd probably enjoy the movie. Yes. Mm-hmm. But and if you've read the book, don't touch it. Is the book YA? He's just a young adult? Um, I think so. It starts off with a very YA feel, but then it deviates around the middle I mean, of it. It's just it's about a young character. The main character is a young he's, person. He's seventeen. Okay, so it's YA. young adult. I, mean, I wouldn't call it YA based on some of the contents involved I mean, in the book. That's pretty. Sure it doesn't matter. I you're, was just gonna say I think it's still YA no matter what the content is. I mean, also, I don't know if it's classified as it or not. I wouldn't <laughs> call it that. You're also excluding some some really good IPs that they had. Like if you're talking about the movie, I mean, you talk about some Godzilla in there. Yeah, you got to talk about some Gundam in there. Yes, the Gundam. Oh awesome. my god! Oh yeah, they did bring those into the novel too. They brought in. Uh, 
<laughs> really funny instead of Spider Man. And one part he's talking about Spider Man, <laughs> the the Japanese version. Yep. Yeah, and so he gets the giant mech from it, and which is, I think its name was Leopardon. So there's it's not just American IPs in there. Mm. It is other popular IPs across the world brought the, into it. The Iron Giant was there. You got to fight. You know, got to see him summoning the iron giant for a fight and doing you know fighting inside the iron giant yeah it's just it's i thought it was cool but that's the thing i think that it should be a new thing you try is if you see a movie or a book you should find out okay what's the movie about here okay there's the book. Here's the movie. I'm going to watch this movie first. Yeah, absolutely. And watch then, the movie first. No. And then I'm going to read the book <laughs> to find out how much better it could have been. But then you could potentially spoil the book with the movie, and you're going to have to put in a lot more time for the book. Why would you knowingly well, accept yeah, that you whenever that? you point. know you're going to spoil the movie by making it hot, stinking, fecal garbage by reading the book first? The book you have to dedicate hours and hours and hours right. of time to. And the movie is just sit down for, you know, less than two hours and just yeah, like take it into your brain. Exactly. And there's a lot less commitment there. So that's why I feel like because I would stop reading a book if I've seen the movie. Like I wanted to read Game of Thrones. Then I watched Game of Thrones. Now I'll never read Game of Thrones because like, really nobody even will though <laughs> yeah, yeah, no one's going to ever finish it. And I, if I wouldn't have watched it, I think I would have read it. Well, we're, but, we're the last generation uh, mm-hmm. of people that will know what Harry Potter was like without seeing the movies. Like we had a preconceived mm-hmm. visual in our own brains from reading the Harry Potter series before we saw the movie. We were th- we're the last generation to get that. Do you think if Ready Player One would have been made closer to the '90s, it would have been a, more of a success compared to the book? Maybe. Well, I th- I think the book was written more for our generation, mm-hmm. more than like young adults now, based on the different IPs that it pulls from. But it also pulls heavily from the 80s. Um, so I think it appeals to us and some of the people that are slightly older than us. Uh, so I, I don't think it will translate well into the future. Uh, the book was written, I, I looked it up while, while you were talking about it. It was written in 2000, or it was published in two, 2011. So I'm I'm wondering like because most of the time now if a, if an author is writing a book they're shooting for movie rights eventually because that is where the money is not the book sales that's nothing pales in comparison to what they would make from a movie deal or a TV show deal or whatever a streaming deal and with this I feel like as they were writing it they didn't have that as much in mind I because don't, I don't feel like you did either because it's like. They would have to think like, okay, if this becomes a movie, there's no way I'm going to get the rights to use all of these characters. Well, I think this author in particular did it more as like a love story to Mm -hmm. the things that he enjoyed growing up. Because honestly, I've slept on this book for a very long time. I got it when the author was just giving it away. So, I mean, my copy is digital and I got to download it for free because he was like, I love this, and I want other people to read it and love it too. Cool. So that was how I got a hold of it, and I was just looking for something to read and going through my bookshelves, and I was like, well, I've slept on this for a very long time. I'm going to give it a shot. So I read it, and it was fantastic, and then I was like, I think they made a movie out of it. So mm-hmm. then I went to the movie and just was upset. <laughs> from the from the first 20 minutes, I was very upset he spaghetti. But it's like it's the perfect idea to be put to screen because it's like all a bunch of video game characters involved in it. But there's also that weird disconnect because it is about video games and you play video games. You don't watch video games. Uh, You watch part of video games, but you mainly play it. So there's this weird disconnect to where they've got to do a good enough job in making the main character's point of view relatable enough to feel like you're interacting with all the characters. And I think that's where when I watched the movie, because it was it was entertaining. It was fun to watch all the stuff. I mean, they even had Overwatch characters in it, which was obviously not in the book. I have no idea. Yeah, but the they had Overwatch characters in the movie, which was cool because I was crazy about Overwatch at the time. But I don't know. There was a disconnect there to where I was like, I'm not super into this. It's fun to watch it happening on screen. But again, I don't care. Like it's yeah. it's one of those. Well, like things. the point of view and the motivations uh, mm-hmm. for the protagonist in the movie differed from the book gotcha. because 
it, it was it's kind of based on the premise of hunting for the Easter egg, you know. Right. Uh, and in the yes, the main character would have got all this cool stuff, but he did it because he loved the content, and it was all about the hunt and seeking and trying to find. Because the author himself used to love to try to find Easter eggs by the creators and the various games that he played. So to me, it was a little more relatable from that aspect as opposed to the movie, which was like the visuals are cool. Like King Kong sitting there doing King Kong stuff in the middle of things that King Kong should have nothing related to. It was cool to see, but it wasn't true to the source. I think what succeeded better on screen was Wreck-It Ralph when it comes to having video games on True. screen because it pulled from a bunch of different IPs and they also had to do the whole thing to where they kind of switch it up here and there. Yeah. I mean, even the main character is a Mario ripoff yeah. and a Donkey Kong ripoff. You know, like that's what the two main characters are. And it was very <laughs> successful, but it also was made for the screen. Like it was, that's all it was made for. It wasn't made for a book too. And what was another one that failed? Pixels, I think. Was that an Adam Sandler movie? Yeah. Like, I think that bombed hard. Yeah, like, it's it, hard to make a good video game related, like like based around video games movie. They like, were champion arcade children. <laughs> That's it's basically like you got to get the voiceover guy in a world where children championed the arcades. That was Pixels. Yes. Because, oh, yeah, I never watched it. Uh, oh, I did. It was Hot Stinkle. Oh, it was Hot Stinkle Fecal Gable? <laughs> it, no, it was Hot Stinkle. Oh, jeez. I mean, it wasn't quite Hot Stinking Fecal Garbage. Right. It was Hot Stinkle. Mm. It had some okay. <laughs> moments, okay. but that's all they got. I think the book, I think I was put away from like wanting to read the book because I'm like, it's a book about video games? Like To me, that was like a... I don't know. Like it, it didn't seem right in my head. Like I yeah. think I want to play those. I don't want to read a book about yeah, it. It's more about the culture right. as opposed yeah. to the video yeah. game. But you, you would know if you read it. Yeah. Uh, I actually went through it with the auto. I didn't mean for that to sound condescending, even what? though it came no, across no, that way. No, no, it didn't. But not to me. Uh, <laughs> Idiot. I, I listened to an audible, and uh-huh. Will Wheaton is the narrator. Oh, and cool. believe it or not, he's a fantastic narrator. Yeah. So, just throwing that out there for all the little Will Wheaton fanboys. I thought that you were saying you were trying to get into the idea of reading the pixel novelization. No! <laughs> and I was like, oh, no. wait, what? No. <laughs> Absolutely not. Surely the book will be better than the movie, right? <laughs> Let's hope. Just like the history that you will receive... Going back in time all the way to 1969. Nice. nice. Woodstock in 1969. Nice. <laughs> it was a celebration <laughs> of art, of just f- passion. It was three days of peace and music. And drugs. <laughs> what was that? What was that, Marcus? What, what was that? I'm sorry. And drugs. Okay. Thank you. And drugs. <laughs> and, oh, that drugs. was a, that was an afterthought, though, because I mean, pe- you know, the acid movement, and then you've got the the whole marijuana stuff, and every that's everybody was just free love, man, you know, and all that. But I never knew because I kind of ignore things. I ignore things a lot because Woodstock. It was a very what's that? Uh I'm trying to think of, of of the word that's just now slipped my brain. I don't know what it is. It's like a staple. Carnage. When you're, you're thinking about no debauchery. No, it's it's whenever you're thinking of something that just like automatopoeia. It's a milestone. It was a milestone for for just the the gathering of musical talent and everybody that was there. I mean, you had everybody from Joe Cocker to Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin and all these big name people that are coming there and playing to perform for everybody who's under the same blanket of we need to celebrate love and we need to celebrate music. We need to celebrate this togetherness. And then you've got Woodstock that happened again in 1994 because, you know, if it worked once, 
you know, we we need to try to get this again. We need this. We need this feeling. We need this togetherness. Hold on, I thought Woodstock was like an money. annual event. No, on mm-hmm. Oh, it's not. Wow, well, it's way off. No, man. no. And they had a lot of different people at that one too for '94. But then you started getting artists mixed in with it that were like Blind Melon playing along with Joe Cocker on the same scheduling. And you've got all these emerging bands from the 90s like Blues Traveler and Cheryl Crow and Collective Soul, Candlebox. I mean, there's just a lot of people from the 90s that we would all remember from this stuff, from this time period. The reason that I'm talking about this is because I've recently watched a documentary that showed me possibly one of the biggest train wrecks of a music festival that I've ever seen. It's something that my dad has told me a lot throughout my life, mostly talking about my brother because he was always getting in trouble for doing different I'm a dumb kid stuff. And he said, this is the example of what not to do. We're going to talk about Woodstock 99. (laughs) And in Woodstock 99, they had this idea that they're going to try to revive the peace, love, and music that they had in Woodstock in 69. 94 didn't work out too well for them. Just with way worse music. So bad. 94 didn't work out very well for them because statistically they sold 164,000 tickets to that show. That's awesome. That's a lot of people. There were 350,000 people that attended the festival, though. (laughs) They had no idea how to keep up with security and how to keep up with people, you know, fence gap finding and just getting into the venue because they held it on a different farm located about 60 miles north of where the original Woodstock was located in New York. Mm -hmm. So they thought, you know, this is going to be a great idea. Well, storms came. The fences became loose because they were just chain link fences they had installed into the ground the ground softens people basically just oh this fence will come up now yay free entry woodstock 99 they tried to make up for the fact that 94 was a flop only in the sales ratio and the three deaths but 99 instead of it being in a field or on a farm like the other two were because you can't keep security tight on a farm it's very hard to do how are we going to how are we going to remedy this? Well, it just so happens there's a humongous like 8,000 acre abandoned Air Force base that's located in New York as well and let's rent this out. We'll we'll lease this out. We'll we'll have tons of security because it's an Air Force base. So what they're going to do is they're going to cram this exact same crowd into an Air Force base, instead of them being... Now, just imagine this, folks. Imagine this. You're going to a music festival, and you're excited to see bands play, and it's very hot outside because it's the dead heat of summer, and you're walking on 80% tarmac. Jeez. Angry and nude. That's what I would be. (laughs) (laughs) Those are the two things I would be. Angry and nude. All right, we'll get to you here in a minute. But then the water, like, and they they were charging so much money for water. Here's here's the failings Mm -hmm. of it. The the idea of having a music festival and trying to run it like a business, that exists. But the way that they were doing it, they cut so many corners because they wanted to make money. Money. They wanted more money, more money, more money. We had a big flop in 94 by doubling the people coming in, but only receiving less than half of who actually paid. Like, that's not, they they wanted to prevent that. So, everything that they they did for the 99 was basically like, it almost seemed militarized because it's. Well, they're on a military base. You know? But it was fit, it was fitting because you you know you had to pay an outrageous ticket cost to get into it. It's like two hundred bucks back in the nineties, and then you had you went in and the first thing that they did whenever you go through the gates uh, was that they would take away everything that you had that was edible or liquid, including water. What about cavity checks? Uh, I don't think they had dentists on site. So <laughs> what happened is they would get in and after they took all of your water, you're welcome for that. Uh, so they've taken your water so you go in and you know water costs were initially you know not that crazy it was a little crazy but people were expecting oh well it's a concert so they were charging like two dollars a bottle for water 
cool because there were also drinking fountains and in f- free flowing water fountains and stuff that were around, as well as showers and toiletries and stuff. But they only booked it up for about a quarter of the amount of people that were going to be there to for max occupancy, like occupancy to be able to even have this working. You would have to have it, the math is ridiculous on it, but they, it's basically like, hey, let's have this entire crowd of people and everybody can crap in a porta potty, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. like, all right, we got yeah, 7000 people to this one porta potty. Nothing bad's going to go wrong. I mean, it's still awful, even at big festivals like Bonnaroo now. I mean, the, the porta potty situation is just ungodly. You just can't get that part right. They, well, because it, they, you think that it's going to work. You think it's going to work or they're just going to deal with it. And I think a lot of times the people that are throwing those big kind of events are are figuring if they want to be here bad enough, they're just going to deal with it. Well, in 99... Just wear diapers. Yeah, you know, just get a catheter. You know, you don't really have to pee that bad. I have external ones now. You know, go ahead, go ahead and get a colostomy bag. You know, you don't have to poo-poo. You don't have to pee-pee because you got it carried around in bags. Just go about again. the music, baby. Go, go for the music and the love for $200.99. Where are you going to empty that bag? So the, the thing that they didn't really think about too much is the way that the music has changed and the people have changed over generations. So people that were wanting to belong back in 69, that were wanting to be a part of something bigger than themselves, that went to Woodstock, they wanted to go because of the peace and the love and the sharing the joy of music. In 99, we had something come along in the music scene referred to as new metal Boo. Boo metal. New metal. <laughs> and that, you know, you're bringing along some corn. You're bringing along some limp biscuit. You're bringing Gross. along some heavier sounding stuff that's just basically mad about being mad and they're pissed off and angry about it. And they're going to tell you. A lot of rap elements, too, in the in new metal. Yes. And with, you know, the, the show opening up, corn took the stage. Just Got the juice. <laughs> Oh, I can't get over that stupid little kid. It's so oh, funny. God, it's cold. It's got the juice. It's got the juice. The lump of knobs. Uh, <laughs> it's so good. It's so um, good. Are you ready? And then the crowd starts going crazy, and they're looking out at 150, 200,000 people just going nuts out there. But these people aren't about peace, love, and music. These people are. Like the hyper masculine, typical frat guy, like trying to show out and be the big man and all this other stuff. But you get them all together and they have to outdo each other constantly. Mm-hmm. And it just became a big wreck. The train wreck of it all was when you've got all these people that are under sanitary. They had no sanitation services booked to actually cover the event. So every time somebody would throw trash away in one of their probably like 25 garbage cans, (laughs) there was nobody to empty it because they had let the sanitation go to like a fourth party. By the end of the first day, there were already just trash. What did they call when in the Western? Yes. And when the wind would blow, just... It would just blow garbage. Every, yeah, it was like tumbleweeds. It was awful. And the the sanitation problem there was an issue. Then you had the sanitation problem that was coming along with the toilet situation. Because the way that they were advertised whenever they're getting these, you know, getting to go to this place was that they're going to go and they're going to have all the necessary amenities to enjoy a luxurious time when they're paying these certain package prices. They didn't get that. It's kind of like what happened with the... Uh, what was it? The fire festival? Or? Oh yeah, the fire festival was just absolute disaster. You know, well, it never it, happened. Yes, but with Woodstock '99, they had a problem with attitude to go against it because one of the things that you have to take into consideration is this generation that's listening to that new metal and felt this anger and this rage. They're not just going to see this injustice of this ticket price and the injustice of the way that you've laid us all out on this tarmac, this humongous, overly hot, dehydrating piece of asphalt. You know, you've crammed us all in here and you've now they've got issues with people being angry about lines. You've got people getting pissed off about, I don't get to my shower quick enough. I don't get to that water faucet quick enough. So they start breaking the water pipes. Well, it's like when it's 
that hot and you're on that asphalt and you're dehydrated and you've got angry music happening and it does nothing but breed anger mm-hmm. and then you got trash blowing around and you smell the Porta Johns cooking like five feet from you. You can't buy water. It, it, now, you I'm, can't buy water. It's just a breeding ground for something really bad bad yeah. to happen and then mob mentality takes right. over exactly it's just a complete and total breakdown of human society and what it means to <laughs> and be human a psychology person. yeah i mean it tears you to, it'll tear it's you like down Lord of the flies <laughs> that's what in the documentary yeah. that's what <laughs> that one of the what, guys looked at this documentary yeah. camera because there's there was a camera crew going around this entire thing trying to film the documentary uh not for netflix but just to document the festival happening because it was supposed to be this giant monumentous event and they had oh my god this is the part that made me throw up but i didn't like fully expel it it just i swallowed it oh he was so but, close i heard him from the other room that's when i joined in they had where they broke the water pipes <clears throat> where they broke the water pipes and then there was this over saturation of fecal matter from the porta potties having overflown from how many people have used them then the water that was rushing through everything went to the only sodden soil which was 20 percent there that had the porta johns so all of this water that's rushing from the pipes being broken rushes through and washes through all of the poo-poo residue that's coming out of these porta johns and making them flood and pull this ocean of doo-doo. So because all the free water, yeah, all the free water now has dookie in it. All the free water gets dookie in it. So every time somebody's drinking water from a fountain there, it's in the water supply that they're drinking fecal matter. Mm. Um, th- there were people that were, had to leave because they ended up getting, uh, what was it called? I think it was rot mouth or, or something along those lines to where you had had, uh, no, trench mouth. Poop lips. Basically, yeah, because you're ingesting this unclean fecal infested water. But people had to have the Woodstock experience, man. If you're in Woodstock, you got to play in the mud. They had hundreds of people sliding, fighting, just living it up in this Woodstock mud. They were probably sexing in it, too. Oh, my gosh. That was so it was so disgusting. And it get it gets it keeps getting worse. Because now they've hiked the prices on water and any kind of food that you can get because they've ruined the water supply there because of the, the you know, their their gripes that they had with the organization. So now they boost the prices from water and they go up gradually. Started at like two dollars a bottle, go up to four dollars a bottle. Water ended up being twelve dollars a bottle in nineteen ninety nine at a festival. So these people are not only dehydrated and going broke from trying to get any kind of nourishment that they can because you've taken away every bit that they've tried to bring in with them, that now they're going to start behaving awful. That's where you were talking about that mob mentality comes in because Fred Durst from the old band Limp Biscuit. I got to get this out. You, Fred Durst. <laughs> just in general, just in regular life, just normally. Okay, Agreed. continue. Agreed. Was he a continue. shit sandwich of a person? Uh, no he's the worst. Uh, okay. he, he had he had two options running through his brain, and he's got this. He had an alpha. He had this like big apex alpha brain thing happen, and it, they filmed it. They showed this on the documentary. They had all these fans that were just getting pumped up and crazed, and they're all pissed off already, and the mob mentality is forming, and people are getting just more and more aggressive. And what song do they play from Limp Biscuit? Break Stuff. <laughs> it's just one of those days. And he he had the opportunity to shut it down a little bit. But he saw the ability to manipulate hundreds of thousands of people into his whim, like to what he says is a go. And there is the part of the song that says, give me something to break. Like he just goes nuts on it and they start tearing things apart. They're tearing things from the sound booth that is surrounded by these, these giant wood plank walls. They start ripping those off. The sound booth is out there, you know, on a tower. It's a sound tower at a festival. The crowd starts shaking the tower to try to bring the tower down. And on the radios, Horrifying. they're screaming, like, get out of there. Like, get out of the tower. So they're having to abandon station at the sound booths because people are, are going to, like, they could get seriously hurt or die from this thing being shaken apart. Absolutely. And the main guy that was involved with all of it, I mean, he had, it was him and another person. There were two people that were involved with it as, like, the main 
like say president, vice president kind of deal. Uh, and their names are John Share and Michael Lang. And Michael Lang was one of the original co-founders of the original Woodstock in 1969. You watch these guys on the documentary, and they are the most dodgy. You no, know, I didn't do anything wrong. It was all about peace, love, and music. They still try to sell you that. Michael Lang passed away before the documentary actually aired, but they had him on the documentary talking about stuff. And basically all he said was, it was just a few bad people, you know, and I don't want that to ruin the the, the overall for everyone that, that just so happened to be there because it wasn't it was just a, just a handful of some bad folks, you know, spoiling it for everybody. Not the case because they could have stopped after that and said no more. Mm-hmm. said that this was done. They did not. They continued another day of it. In fact, they decided to hand the crowd <laughs> fire the next day. <laughs> they the sure next, did. The next day. <laughs> oh, that was during the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Uh-huh. And the Red Hot Chili Peppers were playing, and you know all these people, you know, they've kind of calmed down a little bit, and everything seems a little bit, you know, a little bit better off. So Michael Lang... His big idea, his big surprise for everybody, because he's been promising like this, this huge, you know, epic end to the mystery guest thing. Yeah. And people were thinking like, oh, like, oh, oh, shit, Led Zeppelin's going to be here or some like crazy band you haven't seen ever be out playing like they're going to be here. They're going to be here. So rumors. Prince or Michael Jackson or something. So you got these rumors circulating everywhere. So it's like that, you know, it's like in in school where you're trying to see how rumors spread and see you you tell one person in a class something you get to the end that's the way it was spreading that all this stuff was happening so what he had actually done was he was going to have a candlelit vigil at the end of it to commemorate how to to, to commemorate the togetherness and everybody having their candles in solidarity you know and when everyone realizes stupid yeah you've got now this after they've already stolen a vehicle Like <laughs> oh, at the rave party, they've I forgot. Already, they've already <laughs> broke down walls and like have been crowd surfing on plywood. There's poop everywhere. Ev- like, everywhere. everywhere. It's in my raccoon wounds. Now you give them fire. And, and they burned it down. They, they burned, burned the place it, down. They burned it to the ground. It was... It was insane because you watch the you watch the documentary and you see the people that are running around there from entertainment sources trying to get entertainment videos and they're watching a hellish landscape war zone just from people <laughs> at a festival because they're burning it to the ground with the fire given to them by the promoters. And and the promoters, like the the main two people that ran it, Everyone underneath them, even the closest people underneath them, didn't know the surprise at the end. Like there were rumors in the, like the main office of who the big surprise was going to be at the end. And these were the same people that were also communicating with these these owners of the whole shebang. Hey, this is a terrible idea. Or hey, we need to fix this now. Yeah. Hey, do not hand this crowd, this mob, fire, please. We can't do this. And he told that person to shut up and get off the radio. Yeah. Because he was literally telling them what was about to happen verbatim. He's you give these people fire. This is going to be bad. Shut up, get off the radio. And you just you see it flaring up a little bit over in one one corner of the of the festival. Like there's this fire starting to form, and then all the other red pe- hot chili peppers actually had to stop playing. Yes, mm-hmm. so they so like hey guys, please because what what they played a song too because like if you light wanna, a fire or yeah something, I don't know I don't like light my I fire I don't know what it was called but oh, it had yeah. to do with fire yeah yeah so because Fred Durst I mean a lot of people want to blame him I don't. That's kind of their shtick anyway. Yeah. I, I mean, don't blame got- Fred Durst for that. I don't like Fred Durst, but I wouldn't like condemn them for playing that song. I mean, that was part of their set. I would I would never con- like condone what he did yeah. when, whenever he sees them actually already getting hyped up and starting to break things. And then he has the opportunity to hype them up even more. And he tells them that he, you know, fine, give me something to break. And he starts just getting even worse with it, harder with it. He's... 
he he threw gas on a fire. Well, yeah. yeah, like when you're on a stage like that, and if you see that your crowd is getting out of control because of something you're singing, it's your responsibility to cut the song and be like, hey, guys, stop being stupid. They're more apt to listen to you. You're the guy with the mm-hmm. big microphone that they're there to essentially listen to. He saw a God moment, and he yeah. was the God of this, this whole community of people, and he could either be the one that causes chaos to die or the one that creates chaos. And his whole brand was create chaos. Well, and the Red Hot Chili Peppers did the same thing because they mm-hmm. were told just like, hey, we got to get this crowd under control. They've got fire now. And then what do they play? They they immediately <laughs> went back out there and started playing a song about fire. Yep. Yep. And they by the end of the night, there were explosions happening all over the place. <laughs> yes. They were. I mean, it was it was literally like you're watching a yeah. war on video because these people were setting fires to things like food vending machine, like food vending areas that have propane tanks. It looked Semi trucks like, with full gas tanks. Yes, looked like the prologue to Terminator. Kind of. It, it, it mm-hmm. was like Judgment Day out there, and I, just the lack of like, is it ethical responsibility mm-hmm. that I'm thinking that neither of the promoters took upon themselves because they this, they really stood by the idea that there were just a few bad people out there, but they also didn't realize how bad they were screwing the people over mm-hmm. by taking them into this awful environment that they were underprovided for and undercared for and expected to just fend for themselves. Of course it's going to degrade and dissolve into what it did. Well, cuz they had they had they had to have, they had to give political answers. I mean, the, they were already kind of like teamed up with that town's mayor and mm-hmm. all this stuff and so they they just had to, or they would have probably gotten sued a lot more. Like, the, well, it's the, like why did why didn't you get on the phone and try to source things that you needed? I'm not when trying you trying to be on their side. I'm oh, just I'm saying, not either. This is why I'm they just did saying it. if you notice that people are just making giant turd lasagnas and there's trash everywhere, how about you bring in people, make phone calls, bring in the things that you need to correct the mistake. Don't just let it happen. Yeah, it was, it, was make, it, it was make money, not spend more. Yeah, but the thing is, if you don't fix it, you're going to spend more money when you get sued. They didn't have that in mind. And they, they people were graffitiing all over the place there, profit stock, because they realized just how bad that it had turned because the people there were being exploited in the eyes of the people. Like they were being exploited. And they were. And they were. I mean, they wanted to make the profit, and they wanted to make up for what they had felt like had ruined the profitability of Woodstock in 1994. And it just ended up being literally what it was, a big, hot, stinking fecal garbage. Yeah. And if you're thinking, well, when at what point would security, you know, step into these moments? <laughs> the security workers showed up. They were just dudes and they had security shirts. So they would go there. They would sell the shirt off their back to somebody for hundreds of dollars. And that person could get in everywhere they wanted to for free the rest of the time. And that person was there for security. So they were already there for free anyway. They were getting paid. So the security people, most of them were they are just in a part of the crowd. And then even the firefighters were refusing to go out into the crowd to put out the fires because they're like, our lives are at stake here. Yeah. And they were telling them like, well, you're firefighters. This is what you do. Like, and they, no. that's how scared they were of these people because they also saw like the violence that was going on to steal what golf carts. Yes. Where they beat the shit out of the people driving the golf carts and yes. took that and just drove around. And it, I mean, not only that too, but I mean, just the sexual assaults and everything that happened there as well. Was that was, that was something horrific to see like on this documentary and people were reporting this. People mm-hmm. were constantly telling these, like trying to get it to the main, to the higher ups. Like this is bad. Things are going awful. Somebody stole a van driving the van through a dense crowd of rave attendees whilst there was a woman on the inside of it that had been passed out and taken advantage of sexually. It was it was all awful. And then it got that same, the next morning from that was when they had the press conference uh-huh. to where they were talking about everything and going over the events and going over what had been reported and da-da-da-da-da-da-da. And they just denied everything. Mm-hmm. They denied everything. Every bit of liability they would have for stuff by pretending that it wasn't happening. And it it just doesn't sit right with me because I love myself some music. I love the idea of music festivals, not saying I'm going to attend one because I'm not going to do that. (laughs) But you, you see this idea that's supposed to represent something and then you get there 
and it's just an entirely different scenario. It's like you expect to go to the land of Oz where everything is colorful and beautiful and everybody's singing and la la la. And then you're actually in like a World War II movie to where you've gone into like a, an encampment to where you're just concreted in and just completely just enclosed off from the rest of the world and you have to obey these rules or else. And, the and pe- drink poop water. And you yeah. got to drink the duty water. And you have to listen to Limp Biscuit. <sighs> oh, that's no. the most torture of the whole thing. Uh, I, I, I just, I, it was a very, it was a very interesting documentary. Trainwreck Woodstock 99 is available on Netflix for you to watch if you would like to, you know, ingest the chaos. Cause I, I've done my best to try to just give you bits and pieces of it that I can because there's a whole lot of it, but it is a very interesting watch. It is a very interesting look into the Woodstock franchise as it was, as it died in 99. Yeah, it'll and, never be back after that. And, after seeing what 99 became, that's what happened to Woodstock. That's ex- that's where it went. It went down, and it wasn't in a blaze of glory. It went it, was, it, it went down engulfed in flames. That's about as poetic as it gets for it. The next day when they were going around showing footage of that the grounds, like everything was burnt and and still smoking and some fire still there. Yeah. And just and they were interviewing a lot of the people that were there at the at the festival. And they were like, will you ever be back again? They were like, oh, absolutely. There were so many people that they interviewed asking if they like the all these kids that were going nuts. Of course, they want to go back. They just got to have anarchy for a few days. Like, yeah, for the cost of admission. Yeah. But they got to do whatever they wanted and no one was there to stop them. Like no one. So it, it ended up being something that they really wanted. I bet it felt crazy to I be a part did. of that. So yeah. w- what Dane had said about the security guards actually selling their shirts and then a lot of them were the exact same kind of way as the sanitation companies were. Because with them being fourth partied like that, they weren't legitimate big sanitation companies designed to handle these large loads of stuff. They were trash haulers. Like, we're going to just take this trash off for you. They saw how much work there was to be done. They sold their shirts and just joined the party. They they were just attendees from then on. They mm-hmm. didn't work a bit. Yeah. Like, inside this compound was another... It was another world. It was like its own chaotic, dystopic music festival that could be just a novel somebody made up like the whole thing just made up but no it was real it actually happened and getting to see all the footage from it mm-hmm. because you could hear stories from it all all day and be like yeah I'm, I'm sure it wasn't that bad they like long footage of moments to where it's not i mean i'm sure of course it's a documentary they want to make some emotions even more potent by doing certain cuts of certain videos but they have long shots of moments of people setting fire to semi trucks mm-hmm. and explosions from the full gas tanks. And just it's all there on tape. And you get to see the chaos for what it is because without seeing that, without just hearing us talk about it, nothing compared to watching the documentary. No. And there's another one on HBO as well. It, it doesn't necessarily tell it from a different angle, but it, it's got some different moments that it talks about and stuff. So seeing if you want the full like experience of it, HBO also has a, a documentary for it. And Michael Lang, one of the, you know, one of the uh, co co promoters, he had actually seen the people out there ripping the fence lines down where they had these big wooden plank fence lines all around the, you know, the compound to where they had him, you know, they had painted them and they're all peace and love and all this other stuff on there. And he saw people breaking down these walls and destroying all of this stuff. This was the beginning stages of the destruction. And his reaction to it was, Oh, they probably just want a souvenir for to such a beautiful place. <laughs> yeah, a fence plank. I got this from a concert. That's he. He said uh, that's what he said. I just thought he said they were just, you know, they wanted to remember it. They wanted some, uh, you know, a memento, something to to remember it by. And I don't, I don't get, I don't, I don't see how somebody can be so blinded by themselves. But at the same time, maybe it doesn't matter for them. Uh, all the up until their death, they never <laughs> once admitted to it being like. Not successful. Like yeah. he, he thought all the way, of course he didn't think, but he said he stuck to the story of no, it was a successful concert with a few, you know, a few bad eggs in the basket. And it was, it was a great time for everybody yeah. all the way until he died. And it's like, he could was shown videos of everything was happening. And he was just like, nah, 
Moving on. Meanwhile, to the next. meanwhile, the people that were actually on the ground in the management team, like the people that were in charge of actually going out and managing stuff, were literally like, "Fuck that guy!" Yeah, because he knew what was going on and he refused to do anything about it. And you know, the people would go back to their to their little. It was almost like a military office staff kind of housing, you know, staff housing uh, for Barracks. the military. Barracks. Thank yeah. you, Tiny. Brain yeah. was done. You did it. I Yay! did a wrinkle brain thing. <laughs> so they're, they're going back to these, you know, these barracks on the base, and that's where all the people are staying from the management crew and everything. And then the crowds start going so insane that they're like hoarding, like a zombie horde of a destructive, fiery mob coming towards them and all they can do is wait and bar the doors like because they were they were hammering planks of wood up behind the doors hoping to keep these people from getting inside of it and probably murdering them like it's it's unbelievable like watching it it is unbelievable it really is crazy because because like you austin i didn't really realize this like it was just one of those things like I think I got 99 and 94 mixed up in my head because I remember seeing footage of like people sliding in the mud and like being a little rowdy but and that it was kind of a not of a not a successful thing but I had no idea to like what scale they really effed s up out there on in 99 yeah mm-hmm. Yeah, and and but the thing, you know, watching it and watching the people's reaction to it that went there, that just like Dane said, they were so excited to be involved in that anarchy. Like, th- would you go back? Well, absolutely. That's the most drugs I've ever got to do in one place. <laughs> uh, so yeah, Woodstock '99 on Netflix or on HBO. Watch train it. wreck. Train wreck. Train wreck. And uh, this episode was not one of those. Mm, no. I just said, mm, but it sounded bad. Take it for what you will. I don't know. Keep listening to us on iTunes and Spotify and Good Pods and Castbox and all of those with five stars involved. Because if you've listened to us before, you're already in the app. If you just scroll down, there's like the star thing. Click the fifth star, and if it says you want to say something about us, just say good job or bad job with five stars. That's important. And then you can go to Redbubble or Teespring. The links are in the description of the episode to where you can get a t-shirt with all the kind of the mouth open with the big great microphone going into it with her name on it. And I think it'd be real cool to see somebody I didn't know wearing that shirt. Or if you'd like to discuss which version of Faith you like better, whether it be George Michael's version or Limp Biscuit's version, <sighs> you can tell us on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook by looking up at Nerd Grapevine. Or if you wanted to donate a little bit to the cause, you can get on Patreon, look up Nerd Grapevine, and you get a shiny holographic sticker for donating to the cause, as well as unlock future content that we have not released and be able to get exclusive content to things like grape-flavored gaming. It's pretty fun. It's a pretty fun time, you know, and, and trying to navigate the waters of the extreme ADHD and nerdy brains that we all have. Eh. You can find yourself in a sea of... I've been having one of those hairs that grow upward on my upper lip and my mustache that goes oh, up no, in my nostril. awful. Gosh. I hate it. It's I the worst. Those. I've been dealing with that the whole time I've been in here. It's been causing me a lot of discord. <laughs> so there's a link in our description. You can find us on there. You can talk to us. You can share memes and talk about Malcolm and just whatever. It's a happy, slappy, fun time. We're on there live, uncut, and uncensored, and irrevocably circumcised. And now we decide, Tiny, (gasps) when life gives you grapes. I hold them up to my face, and I sniff them real hard, like, (sighs) and I enjoy their smell. Does a grape smell like a grape? They smell squeaky. (laughs) <laughs> they they do smell sweet. They smell like rubbery, the, mm-hmm. like rubbery mm-hmm. grape juice, right? They, they smell more like a florally smell than they smell like an actual grape. Like, do they? like they grape. Don't smell like a food. Grape is a color, mm-hmm. a taste, or a fruit. Right. It is not a scent. Grape mm-hmm. is a fruit, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and not grapefruit. No, that's, that's a bigger that's one. A that's a whole other thing. Fruit. Grapes that's a are fruit. Grapes are grapes that are fruits, and it's grapefruits a grape are a yam. Gra- no, well, you can't make a the pie out of it. It's a yam. It's a grape. It's good for dieting. <laughs> <laughs>